And this is Kathleen from A Great Good Place for Books. And tonight I am so excited. I was just talking with Rachel and we figured out we've known each other for 15 years and um, 16 years. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Um, that's a long time. <laughs> um, and we've been on this writing journey with her since the very beginning. And I am so excited to welcome you guys all to talk about this wonderful book called The Girl Warriors, how 25 young activists are saving the earth. And any of you who knows Rachel knows this has been a passion of hers since, since she was, uh, since I met her actually. <laughs> um, and I'm just so excited tonight that we get to celebrate her and celebrate these wonderful young women who are doing so amazing things, including Sarah. Hi, Sarah. Sarah Goody from Corda Madera is with us tonight. Um, so one thing before we get started, what I'm gonna tell you is I just spoke with Rachel and she would love to come in and sign books for anybody who wants a book. And all you have to do is um, Mike, our, our Zoom master is going to put, um, the link up in the chat, I believe, right, Mike? Out oh, there he goes. And Rachel's gonna come in and sign a book to anybody who wants a book signed. Um, so we would love to uh, have you guys buy a book from us and Rachel will sign it. We can either, you can pick it up at the store, we can mail it out to you. Um, but I am, that's enough of the business stuff. This is just so exciting. When I heard that Rachel had a book I actually, I think I wrote her publicist before I wrote, wrote Rachel and said, I have to do the book release. Thank you so much, Kathleen. Thank it you. just seems so, so appropriate. Thank you. I'm really so honored to be here. And yay, there's Daphne and Sarah. I can't Hi, wait. Hi, Daphne. To and Daphne's time. just joined us. Hi. Hi, Daphne. <laughs> so instead of listening to me talk, since you all know Rachel's awesome and these lovely young women, these powerful women are, um, they're gonna change the world. And so let's hear what they have to say. So let's welcome them all to a great good place for books. Yay, they're already changing the world. Yay, so Kathleen, thank you so much for having me here tonight. I'm so, so excited to have my virtual book launch here at a great good place for books. And as I was getting all my notes prepared, I was actually realizing this is something that um, that I haven't told you, Kathleen, that I was born in Berkeley, but I spent my first few years in Oakland. And my, my first childhood memories are actually right in your neighborhood, running around that park near a great good place for books. Like those are oh, my that's so cool. Yeah, it's amazing. So um, I'm so excited to be here and so, so excited to introduce everybody to two girl warriors from the book, um, Daphne Frias and Sarah Goody. I can't wait to tell you all about them. Thank you so much, both of you, for joining me from each coast tonight to chat with everybody and to get to know everybody. Um, so I adore both of you so much, and I'm like really emotional just seeing both of you on the screen. <laughs> So without further ado, let me start by telling you about Daphne, who is here at past 10 o'clock her time from West Harlem, New York City. Daphne, I know you're a night owl, so thank you for yeah. staying up. So Daphne is a 23-year-old Latina climate justice ad advocate who's also in medical school, which I'll get to. Um, recently, Daphne was selected as one of She the People's 25 Young Women of Color to Watch for, in 2021. Daphne got her start in activism shortly after the Parkland shooting by busing students from her college campus to the nearest March for Our Lives event. And during the recent election, Daphne um, founded a nonprofit called Box the Ballot to harness the power of absentee ballots. Daphne is or an organizer with cerebral palsy, who uses a wheelchair and a proud champion for disabled communities. So yay, thank you, Daphne. And then Sarah, who's just practically around the corner from me, is in Corta Madera, California, a vegan climate activist and a sophomore in high school. Sarah founded the nonprofit This Is Climate Now, and Sarah is a 2020 Diana Award recipient, which honors young people who work to improve the lives of others. 
Um, and just most recently, this month, Sarah organized a climate action crash course, which is a four part webinar series for young people. And um, my younger daughter, Camille, and I were so honored to be able to log into the first series of that. Um, I also am honored that I've met Sarah a couple times in person at rallies and protests. And um, I intended to meet you, Daphne, in March 2020. I'm not sure if you remember that, but I had a whole trip planned to New York. And then COVID hit and shut down the country. And um, so I still intend to meet you one day in person, Daphne. Yes, of course. Okay. So um, let's get this conversation started about Girl Warriors. I'm so happy to see all the comments in the chat and like see all the names popping up and hello to everybody. I'm recognizing so many names. <laughs> Thank you for the love. Um, so. Um, one of the many things that surprised me about writing Girl Warriors was I had no idea that I would be writing the book during a pandemic. So I'd finished researching, I was doing interviews, and then spring 2020, COVID, um, the lockdown. And then I follow both Sarah and Daphne on social media. And so I was shocked and worried. And when I saw that Daphne had been diagnosed with COVID, um, we're all so relieved that you've recovered, Daphne. Um, and around the same time, you found out you'd been jointly accepted to both medical school and the School of Public Health in Maryland. So Daphne, please tell us like about this past year, how it's been for you. Yeah, well, uh, well firstly, I'm so, so excited to be here. Um, I feel like this Girl Warriors journey has been such an amazing process from the first time we spoke during my interview and when you got to speak to my mom for the book as well. She always talks about that phone call and how she loved speaking to you that day. Um, so I've been waiting for this day so eagerly. Um, but yeah, it's, it's been incredibly crazy this year. Uh, actually, next week on April 14th, we'll mark one year since I received my COVID negative test, um, which ended a 30 day long battle with COVID-19 and pneumonia as well. Uh, and that was an in incredibly uh, rough ordeal. As you mentioned, Rachel, I do have cerebral palsy. So I have my fair share of experience being sick, being unwell, but battling COVID was a whole nother beast within itself. Um, but I'm so happy to be here on the other side, stronger and happier than ever. Um, going to medical school virtually is something I never expected to be doing. Uh, I've been working to uh, enter medical school and to become a doctor for the past 10 years of my life since I was 11 years old, um, starting in various programs and entering hospitals since I can remember. Um, and, you know, I couldn't wait for the day that I was finally walking into med school with my white coat. And it definitely looks a little bit different than I expected. But either way, I'm still so eternally grateful to have access to school virtually and to still be able to, you know, learn how to be a doctor and to treat my patients with empathy and with, you know, respect. And that's something that's incredibly important to me. Um, as well as being a scholar of public health, um, you know, as we, we dive more into the evening, you'll hear me say a lot that the climate crisis is a public health issue. Uh, so being a scholar of public health is not just making me a better doctor, but it's making me a better advocate for the world. Um, and I, I'm so happy to be able to still continue my studies in that way, um, to continue learning and to continue growing as, a, as an advocate for everyone. Thank you. Wow, Daphne. Amazing. <laughs> so, Sarah, one of the things that I've seen during the past year is, oh my goodness, you have been writing so, so much. You, um, while I was like getting my notes ready, I was looking up all the articles and op-eds that you've written in just the past year, um, and including one of the first articles I read by you was an op-ed in Teen Vogue that you wrote about climate change activism improved your mental health and you were so open about how in fifth grade you were diagnosed with clinical depression and becoming an activist really reconnected you to, to people and to life again. And 
So can you walk us through, I know you've also had so much going on um, this year. Walk us through what this year has been like for you. Yeah, well, first off, thank you so much, Rachel, for having me and Daphne here. I, I, I know I, speaking for myself, you have just been uh, the biggest source of inspiration and light over the, you know, ha- how long I've known you, it feels like just the other day, but it's probably been over a year by now, I am just always motivated and inspired by the absolute kindness and compassion that you bring to your work every single day. And I am so grateful to be here today um, that you are telling our stories. It, it really means the world uh, to me and I'm, I'm sure to Daphne as well. So yeah, it's it's been a absolutely crazy year. I, I don't even know where to start. It seems like just the other day we went into lockdown and all of a sudden I was doing high school on Zoom and learning how do I balance a, a whole high school experience on Zoom being a freshman, the weirdest thing in the world. But you know, through all of it, I think I've really learned how to be resilient, how to stand up to challenges and uh, turn maybe a negative situation into a positive situation, which I think really goes back uh, to my experience with mental health and how I was uh, really able to utilize activism as a tool to help me combat depression. And although I think mental illness and depression isn't something you can necessarily get rid of forever. I think it is something that you can learn to deal with and you can learn to live with. And activism and climate activism in in specifically has really helped me do that, has helped me reconnect to a passion, uh, has helped me find a community of supportive people who are always there for me, like you and Daphne, and has really helped me foresee a future for myself, one where I'm not only focusing on myself, but on other people, and how do I come together with so many of my allies uh, to create a society that's so rooted in these uh, common concepts of peace and justice and compassion. So I'm so excited to be here today tonight and you know just so grateful to be on with both of you thank you thanks Sarah wow I'm getting oh Terry <laughs> so um as part of the research that I did as I was interviewing every activist for Girl Warriors is I would write down just a couple of words that came to mind like right after an interview Um, And Daphne for you was just like determined. That was like the word I like wrote it in really big letters in my notes. And I just, it just came across so clearly. Um, I know you also describe yourself, I think in your social media profile um, as an organizer, advocate, storyteller, peace builder, unapologetically fierce Latina, who's also proudly disabled. And Daphne, I wanted to ask you, how is your determination showing up today, right now in the world? Yeah, well, firstly, um, I think for me, it's, uh, I really ground my work in the power of story and the power of storytelling. Um, And when I was first starting uh, out in my activism journey, uh, I realized that I embodied many different diverse areas and I was a part of many diverse communities that for those who were looking to commodify my story it was very easy to do so um and I had to take a step back and really ask myself who am I and what do I represent and what is the space that I'm trying to carve for myself and for my community in the work that I'm doing and in asking myself those questions I realized that you know no one can tell my story the way that I can and as many people who might identify with the same markers as I do, my lived experience is only my own. Um, And that the way that I can bring community together and uh, sort of reach across the aisle is by empathetically sharing stories and by sharing human experiences that bring us all together. Um, And I think that uh, in my story is rooted through and through determination. Um, When I think about even now when I, um, I'm i doing clinical rounds for uh, medical school. Uh, so uh, every couple of uh, weeks I switch departments of where I'm working. Um, and most recently I was working uh, in labor and delivery. 
Um, <laughs> it was an incredible experience to bring life into this world and to help families start this amazing new chapter of their lives. Um, but I also did encounter pushback from patients questioning whether, you know, being treated by someone with a disability was ethical and whether I would be able to perform to the best of my ability. Um, and, you know, while I prepared mentally for this pushback because I, I had anticipated that something like this would come about, it's so hard to hear, obviously. But in, in those discussions with my patients, as hard as it was, I assured them that my, my goal isn't to try to convince you with my word, it's to convince you with my actions by being the best healthcare provider I can be for you and your family to make sure that this is a safe experience, a pleasurable experience, and one that you're gonna remember positively for years to come. And at the end of these uh, sometimes 36 hour long births that I was helping on, uh, we would have a new wonderful life coming into this world. And parents would tell me I wouldn't have wanted anyone else to be on my team. And that, that, that's what I'm there for. You know, that is the point of this journey and the point of this goal to find community and uplift people in ways that maybe they hadn't realized they needed before. Um, and to show your strength and power through action. Um, and I think that determination cannot exist without empathy and empathy always has to lead the way going forward. So something I always say to myself and sort of a motto by which I live my life is to leave light where darkness dwells. Make each day a little bit lighter than when you found it. We're all going through so many difficult challenges. This year has been incredibly tolling. Um, and there's already so much turmoil that we have to deal with. So wake up each day and leave, leave your space, leave your, your environment a little lighter and brighter than you found it. Thanks. I'm sure everyone here is, can feel like why they would want you, Daphne, on their team. <laughs> it's just, yes. <laughs> um, yeah, and I'm so, um, I'm remembering that conversation with your mom who was so, so open and sweet. And yes, she used the word determination about you as well. And then um, Sarah, I was so honored that I got to speak to your dad <laughs> and interview him after I spoke to you. And your dad talked about how he experienced how you found your voice as an activist. And I've seen that in the year plus since I've known you, um, reading your writing and watching your webinars and your live Instagram chats. Um, and can you tell us right now, like how would you say your voice is showing up right now in the world? I, I, I never, you know, as, as a young child uh, growing up thought that I had something important to add to most conversations, especially not a conversation uh, around climate change, an issue that seems so broad and so big and hard to tackle. Uh, and over the past few years, I've really come to terms in understanding that you know, everyone has a unique perspective and everyone's voice is important in creating solutions. And no one should feel like they aren't important enough or their voice doesn't matter because when talking about climate change and talking about these huge social justice issues, we need everyone speaking up and we need people coming together and uniting for justice. And I like to think that over the past few years, I've really come to terms with who I am, with what my voice represents and how I want to bring that out into the world, uh, especially through what I'm love to do, which is writing and journalism and speaking up and having stories and talking with other people and through conversations, trying to, again, tell stories like Daphne said, you know, storytelling is, is so powerful. And I think especially within the climate movement, it, it can be one of our greatest, I, I like to say, superpowers or tools in in changing the world and in creating a future uh, that's that's more just and equal for all people. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah, so much. And I'm going to dive in. I see um, if anyone would like to ask a question, feel free to put questions in the Q&A box. I see a question that came up from my dear friend, Desiree, who's here from Arizona. Thank you so much, Desiree, um, for calling in Desiree. And I've been 
through um, a lot together. <laughs> and Desiree asked how I came to choose the girl warriors who I interviewed for this book, which is such a good question. I um, initially started reading about climate activists in the news, Greta Thunberg, um, of course, and I will um, just come clean and say that, yes, I did try and contact Greta at the beginning of the process. She was unavailable for an interview. So I had initially reached out to a few climate activists when I was working on a post about um, for the Washington Post and was interviewing climate activists and their mothers who are supporting them in this work. And so that's when I realized, oh my goodness, there aren't just a few climate activists right now. And there, it's incredible how young people are rising up all over the world. And it really, I'll give a, a shout out to a, a local climate activist named um, Jonah Got Gottlieb, who I had seen Jonah in the news and just contacted him because he was local. We have yet to meet, although he's in UC Berkeley, but he called me back and he's like, I'm gonna give you a, a few names and phone numbers of people, of activists. So that's how it got started. Just, he gave me a few names, which was so generous. And then everyone was so, so open to talking. And as I say in the introduction to the book, like that youth, youth activists led me to one. And every time I interviewed someone, um, I'd hear, well, you should speak to so-and-so, you should speak to so-and-so, and you all are incredibly active on social media, but I was just blown away by any time I would message someone, just the response was so open and like, sure, I'll chat with you. So thank you for that question, Desiree. Um, I'll also add that another big thing when I was raised the elections were over the 2020 election. So I wrote the introduction and I was just in despair, like not sleeping or anything. And um, then we found out um, my, my older daughter, May, ran into the room, mommy, mommy, Joe Biden won. Camille and May and I were just like ecstatic. Kamala Harris, we were screaming out the window. And so I called my editor and was like, can I revise the introduction? Um, because my gosh, the world, so grateful, like all the work that we did to um, get a new administration. So that said, let me ask both of you, under this new administration in the White House, how are you asking people to show up now? Like, what's a message you each would like to share with everyone tonight? And Sarah, do you wanna go first? <laughs> Sure. I, I think one message that's really an important takeaway is now that we have leaders in office who are prioritizing climate action, who flat out believe in climate change and are uh, putting forward new proposals to help reduce our global carbon emissions, I think the next step is really holding those leaders accountable, is making sure that they follow through with their actions, that they stay committed uh, to these actions and continue prioritizing uh, the needs and and the desires of not only young people, but of our, our, our whole society, of our nation, and is not afraid to do what's right and to stand up for our planet, for the human race, and to really take action on this issue. And, you know, going off of that, addressing climate change like the emergency that it is within our own government, treating it with the urgency that it requires, because this is an issue that we are going to be dealing with for a long time. And it's an issue that's already impacting people today. So many times I hear people thinking of climate change as something of the future, uh, when this is something that's impacting people right now, today. And we need to start treating it like the emergency it is, in the same way that we might treat the COVID-19 pandemic, to treat it like a crisis and like an emergency. So again, I think those two things are holding our leaders accountable and really treating climate change with the urgency that it commands. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Yeah, Sarah, I 100% agree. I, you know, as a future healthcare provider, I understand first and foremost that the 
the pandemic has gripped all of our attention and all of our minds. But long before COVID existed, we already had a pandemic on our hands and that was the climate crisis and that has not gone away. Um, and we need to remember that and recenter those conversations about the immediate action that needs to take place. Um, communities of color who have been disproportionately impacted by the by the pandemic are also still being disproportionately impacted by the climate crisis. And those issues are only being exacerbated now that those climate conversations have been silenced because of the pandemic. We need to remember that the communities that are on the front lines are still hurting and they're still out here waiting for action. Uh, I think also we need to call on the administration to take actions of divestment seriously to understand that divestment does not have to be a scary thing and it doesn't have to be something that is destroying our economy because it's not going to be. It, divestment has to become a palatable topic and a palatable conversation that goes around our household the same way like we talk about recycling. You know, we have to, we have to ingrain those ideals and help educate uh, Americans about what divestment actually is and how um, just divestment looks like um, for all of our communities. And I think that we have, um, you know, we, we're lucky to have an administration now that we don't have to convince that science exists and that we don't have to convince that the climate crisis exists. And I think that, that while that is great, that is the bare minimum. And that shouldn't, that was a fight that shouldn't have ever had to be had. So now that that's out of the way, we need to begin holding um, our administration accountable, like Sarah said. I also think it's important that we're, we're making sure to center the appropriate voices, center indigenous native voices, center voices of color within the climate movement because we have long been fighting for the climate crisis way before it was popular or way before it was making headlines. There's been communities out there fighting for generations and we need to make sure those voices are centered in the conversation. Thank you. Yes. And yeah, on, on that note, um, Marianne wrote in a question asking how you two deal with just being so frustrated with adults who it's clear what we need to do. You two already have so much on your plate. For example, even something like divestment. Um, it's clear what we need to do, but then watching all these adults um, just continue to make decisions that are, are for the worst. Like how do you to deal, Marianne specifically says, how do you to feel about, you have so much on your plates? I'll go first if that's okay. Um, I think it's about remembering that one, the whole, the stake of the whole entire world doesn't rest on your shoulders. And that's really, really hard to remember because I know, I know Sarah feels the exact same way. We wake up every morning, it's like, yes, I'm going to do the whole thing. I'm going to save the whole world all by myself. And it's like, it's going to happen. And I think it's like you build up so much fear about the idea of stepping away just for even taking lunch or taking a sip of water because you feel like in that 30 seconds something's going to come tumbling down and you're like no I could have been there I could have done something but it's about remembering that we all hold each other up we are a community we are an ecosystem and if you have to step away for a moment there's hundreds of amazing other young activists out there ready to pick up that load and ready to make sure that the appropriate voices are being heard and as you said uh, Rachel the way that we are all interconnected, the way that we all know each other is so amazing, whether we've met in person or not. I mean, you know, you were talking about Jonah and Sarah and I have been connected over social media for such a long time. Um, and I know that if I have to take a step away, that they're there to hold up, you know, my piece of the bargain and we've got each other's back. Um, but I think in terms of how do we deal with the adult frustration, well, we don't wait and we don't take no for an answer. That's, that's what you have to do because, frankly, the adults have failed us for way too long and they don't seem to be wanting to work at the fast enough pace that this issue demands. So we got to light the fire under their chairs a little bit because we got to get moving on this. Um, there's no time to waste um, and the science says so. And I think... Um, going into rooms with legislators and Congress people when um, 
you know, the people who make this stuff happen. You have to walk in there with conviction and say, no, I know the answers. It's time for you to sit down and let me tell you what's going on because you haven't been listening and the decisions you've been making are not working. So I don't think you're in the position anymore to be making any decisions or taking advice because it hasn't been working. And I think as a generation, as Gen Z, we have that immense power. Um, and it's also remembering that the leaders of uh, you know, corporate, oil and things of that nature they also have young kids they have grandkids they have kids and for using that to our advantage they're having those conversations with their parents and saying you're destroying my future you're destroying our future and we all have to work together to make something happen because there isn't one person that the climate crisis doesn't affect um and we all have to work together to make sure that something changes yes yes for sure thank you so much and um, Sarah, on that note, and feel free to add more to that question, but I saw another question pop up, which is very along similar lines from, from Kirsten. Thank you, Kirsten. Um, Kirsten's talking about how, like, as we all know, the climate crisis is such an overwhelming issue. So just on a day-to-day -day basis, how do you help empower other people to say that, yes, change is possible. Yes, we can do this. We can get, how do you, I mean, I've seen you do this in action. <laughs> I mean, climate change, it, it's a scary issue. It, it's its really overwhelming and it can feel like, you know, as one person, how, how am I going to possibly go ahead even chipping away one piece of this puzzle? And I think it's starting to go away from that mindset and, and looking at this with an optimistic and a hopeful viewpoint and trying to see that, you know, yes, you may be one person, but you are one heck of a strong and a powerful person and you can go out and you can change the world. And there's so much strength in numbers, just looking at the young people who are already out there, who are on the front lines, who are doing this work. Uh, we are such a resilient generation and a generation that's not taking no for an answer. And that really makes me hopeful for our future, for what our world is going to look like going forward. And, you know, sometimes it, it, it's helpful to just take a step back and to, to look at the problem and see that, you know, you cannot defeat climate change yourself. This is not an issue that you uh, as one person have, have to go about solving because you have so many people who are there to support you, who are also doing this work, who want to help out and who want to be allies and, and really change the world alongside you. So I think the biggest uh, takeaway from that is that you know, finding support, finding a community, connecting with other young people who are doing this work, or if you're an adult, you know, connecting with other adults who are doing this work and, and just simply talking about it and starting to understand uh, where you fit into that huge puzzle that is the climate crisis. Thank you, thanks. And yeah, I love what, um climate expert scientist Kate Marvel says that she's written about saying that we need courage, not hope to face the climate crisis. Cause I think we can always like get caught up in that word hope, but courage is when like you actually act. Um, so, so yes. Um, let's see, there's another question that popped in from, from Mary. Hi, Mary. Um, at saying that there are so many girl warriors out in the world, any chance will there be um, another book. So I'm actually working on another book right now for Chicago Review Press about um, another climate book for their Women of Power series, which is for young adult readers who are teens, about 15 women in climate. So these are women who, um, a lot of climate scientists, women in policy, um, women who've started nonprofits. And so I'm in the middle of interviewing these women right now. And um, yeah. And this book will, my hope is that like with Girl Warriors, we're, we'll encourage more girls and young women to go into STEM as well. And um, let's see, well, I'm wondering if Sarah and Daphne, is there, is there anything else that you would like to add to the conversation tonight to everybody listening? Yeah, I saw a question sort of like, how do you, 
start the conversation with young climate activists who want to get into this space. And I always love answering this question because I, even though, you know, Sarah and I are experienced now and it seems like we have well-oiled machines, I promise you there's still days that we literally don't know what we're doing. And <laughs> we're, we're working as we go and we're, tr we're just trying to make it work. Uh, so I think that that's, that's one thing to remember that what you see on social media, you know, the well-crafted campaigns you put out, that's months of sleepless nights and working together on social media with friends. And it, it's, it takes a lot to get that final product. So um, don't feel discouraged by how clean and polished everything looks because I promise it doesn't start out that way. Um, but I also think that something I like to tell people is that words are the building blocks of revolutions. Words is, are what create change and words are what are gonna make the future better. And I, words come in multiple different forms like Sarah's journalism, but also through conversation. Um, I think the best way to get started is by asking questions and by having conversation. You'd be so surprised how your neighbors are probably feeling the same anxiety and having the same questions as you are, but it takes that one person to say, hey, do you feel the same way? Do you, do you think the same things that I think? Um, and I can tell you, I haven't met one young person so far that even if they aren't super embedded in the climate crisis movement, they at least worry about the climate crisis and they want to have conversations about it. And I think um, finding that community, finding your people um, within your sort of immediate area is always helpful. But I also think that the power of social media is incredibly valuable. And I mean, like, look at this conversation, we're having a coast to coast conversation over the internet. And I think that that's incredibly powerful and do not discount the power of social media and finding your community as well. Um, and then once you have that community, find your elected officials, find your legislators, do a, do a zip code search, an address search, find your local elected officials and bug them till no end. Get them to know your face, get them to know your phone number to the point where they don't pick up your phone calls and, you know, put, put a face to the action, put a face to the work that you want to see them done and let them know that, you know, maybe the whole county isn't holding them accountable, but you and your friends are holding them accountable and you remember the promises they made to you on the campaign trail and you're making sure that they follow through. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Yeah, adding on to another question that I see in the chat about uh, what advice would you give to adults and parents and how can we empower young people as they step into their roles as activists? I, I mean, I know the first step that is sharing this book, sharing Girl Warriors uh, with the young people in your life, providing them with a sense of inspiration. I know I would have been so blown away had I been hearing about Daphne when I was younger, it would have absolutely changed my world. And I think it's those senses of inspiration, those, those moments, those interactions, and seeing that you're not alone, that there's so many other young people and young girls who are passionate about this issue and who are showing that, you know, no matter their age, no matter their identity, no matter what they look like, that they can go out there and they can change the world. They can make the world a better place. So I, I really think sharing this story and sharing other stories uh, to help your young person find a sense of inspiration and feel a sense of belonging in this movement. And from there to share different resources with them, whether that's watching documentaries with them and listening to podcasts, trying to better understand climate change together. Maybe it's showing them an organization that they can volunteer with. Uh, maybe it's helping them write to a local politician or congressman, whatever it is, going on this path together, showing them that you support them. Uh, that, can, that can make the whole difference when it comes to taking action. And I, I can't wait to see what all of your young people do. Can I can I pop in here real quick? Um, sure. We have a we have a, a message from um, one of our attendees who said it's important important to note adults don't know what we're doing either, which is true. And this is the beauty of this work. I think we're all trying and the best work is yet is the work that has just that has just been started. And I want to say that just listening to your stories, I mean, I'm absolutely blown away and I'm so hopeful for the future because you guys are our future. 
and and I feel that that we have something to look forward to, to see what you guys are going to do next. And um, Sarah, what are you planning to do uh, when you go to school? Uh, we all know Daphne's going to you know take over the medical field, but um, <laughs> Sarah, what what are your plans? To be honest, I have no idea. <laughs> I, I feel like my answer changes, uh, you know, day to day. And four years ago, I wanted to be a dancer and a Broadway performer. And now here today, that is not at all the, traje the trajectory that I'm seeing for myself. I think that we can't really predict what our lives are gonna look like. They change on a day-to-day -day basis, but I, I know whatever it is I'm doing, it's gonna involve uh, standing up for not only our environment, but for the people that live on this planet and all living things. It, it's, it's gonna involve fighting for a cause that's so much greater than myself. And some things in specific that I've been really passionate about are again, journalism, seeing how I can can raise awareness through writing and through speaking up, um, working potentially within the Broadway community and theater community and seeing how I can bring sustainability there and create a greener theater industry. Uh, those are two things in particular that I've been really interested in and uh, can't, can't wait to start exploring. But yeah, again, I guess we'll we'll just have to see where, where time brings us, but I'm, I'm excited for the future and excited to see where that will take me. We have a comment from Kirsten. Um, she wanted to say that what amazing people. So I, I think she's wonderfully impressed with you guys as I am. Um, I'm always floored by what young people will, are capable of. What a blessing you got to know these young women, Rachel, and introduce them all to us. I feel the same way. I feel, I was like getting really teary as you two were talking. I feel so grateful. Wow. That, I've got to meet both of you. I wow. want I wanted to add on quickly to what Tara was saying. It reminded me just just to share with you all that activism isn't just marches and rallies and speeches and all that. Activism exists in every single space and every single form of expression through dance, through music, through art, uh, through whatever may be. You know, being in New York City, I'm surrounded by the most art I can ever find um and hearing Sarah talk about Broadway makes my heart a little sad as I've missed the the community and the industry so much uh, but we need everyone we need every intersection to come together to really make a make a change and, and make you know a climate conscious future a reality whether we talk about fast fashion and making fast fashion more sustainable whether we talk about like what Sarah was saying bringing art to meet the intersection of sustainability all of those things are important and I think if you're a young person seeing other young people out there doing marches and rallies and you're feeling like, well, that's not really my vibe, that's not really my space, do not, do not be discouraged because your voice still matters. And I, I promise you there's a niche, there's an intersection of where you can find your voice and express yourself in a way that you feel is authentic to yourself. I also want, I, I know that this, this year and this time, it can feel like an alternate timeline. And I wake up and I'm like, this is this is what the Twilight Zone must feel like. Um, but I also just want like, I want adults to know that like your allyship means so much. Um, people like Rachel are incredibly invaluable. And I cannot tell you just like Rachel and I have been, you know, tagging each other on social media, getting ready for this event. Every time I see your name or your tag pop up, a huge smile just comes up on my face and seeing Sarah's work, and seeing her get nominated for the Diana Award, I was so happy that day that announcement came out. And just seeing the wins in our community and having an adult ally like Rachel just authentically represent us in a way that makes us feel proud to be who we are, that's so important. Because as young people, it's hard to navigate this space and hard to know who are your true allies and know who are the people who value you as, as you. And I know that Without a doubt, if I ever want my story to get out there, Rachel is going to be one of those people who are going to make sure that my voice is heard and heard in a way that I feel proud of. Um, so just, just letting adults know that like we need your help and we need your allyship. And as much as you see young people out there doing the work, we would not be anything without our adult allies. And we really need to continue working in tandem with you all because uh, it makes our work much better. Yes, yes. Oh, wow. <laughs> 
And I also saw a comment on there that um, someone commented saying the book's already on back order. <laughs> what do I do? So Kathleen, I know you're gonna, you said still, still click on the link and order. We actually, it's not on back order. I have over a case sitting at the store. Awesome. Great. I will come in because I know I have some books to pick up for Camille <laughs> and I will sign. I will, yes, I will sign them and I can't wait. We've got a couple more comments here. Um, Desiree thinks that you should write a musical about climate change, Rachel. <laughs> yeah, and I'm going to put you, I, it's actually, that was for Sarah, because Sarah with Broadway. Sarah, I'm going to put you in touch with my friend um, Desiree, who runs Broadway shows in, um, on a campus in Arizona. So I'm going to connect you two, and, um, and you too, Daphne. <laughs> yes that I saw that comment come up and I was like, oh my gosh, yes, there's a Broadway contingent here. <laughs> so we've got another comment from Arden who says, um, you guys are so impressive and inspiring and she's really excited to read this book and happy to be here. Well, we're happy to have you here too, Arden. And yeah, Arden is one of my dearest, oldest friends that we met as solo mamas. So Kathleen, she Arden <laughs> met with me and then at the bookstore. <laughs> yes. Yay. Well, I am just so, so thankful to everybody for coming tonight. And Sarah and Daphne, I just can't wait to continue supporting you two and staying in touch and seeing you both soon. Yeah, I'll be making my first uh, cross country trip since the pandemic in about three weeks. And I'm actually mm -hmm. heading out to California for some speaking engagement. I was waiting to tell you both to be on this call because I knew that you were both there. And I was like, oh my God, I can, we can have lunch together. That would be so cool. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I'll be speaking at some universities over there for about, I'll be out there for about 10 days. Um, so once I get all the logistics set up out, I will text you both and then we can have have lunch and meet up and yeah, it would be so fun and I'm so looking forward to that. Oh, I can't wait. I'm so excited. Yay. Don't tell them the days. I can't wait. <laughs> We've got a couple other really great comments. We've got, um, uh, let's see, we've got one from Jacqueline, who wanted to thank you guys for a beautiful conversation. And Jacqueline and is in, in the book too. Jacqueline is in the chapter about me. Jacqueline is an incredible um, teacher here in Berkeley who has a zero waste classroom. So yes. <laughs> and then we've got another one from, I'm not sure, sure who it's from, but um, she said she writes we adults need you guys to steer us and i i couldn't agree more i mean i think that we're in good hands knowing that that our future belongs with you guys and you guys are going to steer us hopefully to a much better future than than uh we've had in the past so yeah. thank I you ronnie for that comment ronnie's a writer in berkeley <laughs> uh, colleen so she feels more hopeful i always I love when people say that because I think also like we should definitely mention like climate anxiety is super real like mm -hmm. waking up each day thinking about like the state of our earth it can be very overwhelming and I think what gets me through those moments is knowing that like we're working on it we're doing the work we have a community here that is as working to be the megaphone for our earth and making sure that we're listening to her um, but also, I, I say for anyone who is looking for a reservoir of hope, get in touch with your local Indigenous communities. They've mm -hmm. been doing this work for so long, and the beautiful practices and how they honor our Mother Earth, as they say, are so incredibly hopeful and inspiring and help ground your, your work and your being here on this planet. So I'd say um, they're, they're incredibly kind, and I've never encountered one community who, who doesn't love to share their um their native traditions um and it really helps ground my activism um in terms of understanding where we're coming from and where we need to go um and i always want to give them as much love as possible because uh, they've been through so much and they they deserve it yeah. so we have 
we have another um, message from someone who's just coming up as anonymous. Um, she wanted to know, Rachel, what it's like working with girls and women all over the world. Well, I'll say um, the reason I started writing this book, and it's probably the reason I've always written one, when I was a little girl, writing was the, the only way that I felt like some kind of power and some kind of sense of myself. Like when I was in third grade, I just remember like writing in a journal and I could feel, feel myself. Then when I became a mom, and that worry about just the world and first my daughter May just out in the world and just being, seeing what was going on in the world and how people were treating each other and just this worry. Then I had Camille and it was just like, then I two daughters out in the world. So having, having my daughters really just set in me this sense of like survival so every single girl and young woman I interviewed and their mothers and sisters and aunts, it was just the same sense of like, yes, we're all here together. And so every conversation I had was really just this sense of like, I'm with you. Yes, I'm with you. We're holding you. Yes, yes. And over and over. So, yeah. Okay, we have another question from Kirsten <laughs> Mahoney. And the climate crisis is such a big overwhelming issue. How do you as climate warriors help people feel empowered that change is still possible? I know I do feel like I, um, well, I was just gonna say I did, I think I did ask that one. So I feel like you both answered that, answered that really, really well. I, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I should also say like young people are becoming elected officials. There are so mm -hmm. many. Yeah. amazing progressive campaigns that are happening all across the country especially in swing states like Georgia if you're seeing the Georgia situation and feeling really discouraged by the craziness that's happening over there I there are so many amazing young progressive individuals who are running campaigns to counter um, the voter suppression that's happening in the state right now so just as Sarah and I've got your back on the climate front there's so many young people doing the same thing on the electoral front I myself finishing my term as an elected official in my community. We're out here doing the work, um, being megaphones for our community. Um, and I think the most beautiful thing is that we're not waiting until, you know, an appropriate time, quote unquote. We're taking action right now. We're we're filling up those seats. We're um, we're transforming the legislature and making it look more reflective of what our generation and what our country should look like and what we want it to look like. Um, so there, there's so many outlets of hope, and I, I would definitely advise, check out your young progressive campaigns in your area, donate to them, support them, canvas for them, phone call, phone bank, do whatever you can, um, because they need your help. Yep. Change isn't coming, it's already happening today, and you know, young people are really an attestment to just what you can do if you have a passion and if you have the courage to act on it. Well, I think this is the perfect time to um, end our conversation tonight. Um, Daphne and Sarah, what a pleasure it is to meet you guys. And Rachel, I need to tell you, I'm so proud of you. You have just been absolutely amazing uh, throughout the years and, and your perseverance and always following your heart and writing about what you believe in. I can't tell you how proud I am of you. Oh, thanks. So ladies, thank you so much. And remember, we do have the books available at GGP at a great good place. And um, you can find uh, us online at www.ggpbooks.com. Or you can call the bookstore at 510-339-8210 at starting tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock. But I want to thank everybody and thank you everybody for attending and Rachel, congratulations. And Sarah and Daphne, I'm going to be watching you guys to see what amazing things you do next. Yeah, follow both Sarah and Daphne on, you can find them on Instagram and Twitter too, so that you can follow them and continue to support their work. 
Thank you. Thank you all so much. And wow, Daphne, I'm so excited to see you. <laughs> <laughs> I cannot wait. It'll be my first time traveling in over 18 months. And yeah. I'm I'm fully vaccinated and I'm just ready to go out and you know meet people for the first time. And I, I might cry because I'm actually with human beings. So be prepared. Um, so I, yeah, I'm just so excited and I'll keep you both updated and we have to take a girl warrior selfie to match up with the book. Um, and yeah, I can't wait. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Thanks. Thanks you guys for coming. And Rachel, I'll see you very soon. You will. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thanks everybody for coming. Bye.